Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of Composers at Home, Maybe Drinking Coffee. Um, I am your host, uh, Elliot Miles McKinley. Um, I hope everybody's doing okay um, in this, uh, and there's my name just popped in below. I, somehow that was a little funny little delay. Uh, we are live. Um, it is 7.33 Eastern Time. Um, yeah, I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, I know that this is something of a strange week so far. Um, I, I don't. I guess I don't have to tell anybody that it's a strange week. We're all kind of experiencing the strangeness. Uh, but I hope if you're watching at least for the next uh, hour, 90 minutes, two hours, uh, that you spend with uh, myself and my guest, uh, Andy Bishop, uh, that this will be a nice little respite from that as we talk music and, and so on and so forth. Um, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't uh, do the social media plug. And so here we have um, the YouTube channel subscription. Uh, if you uh, like this show uh, and would like to, to subscribe, uh, please do. Um, so you can get notices of whenever uh, we have upcoming upcoming shows and when we go live. And if you're over on Facebook, uh, give us a like. Um, and when I say us, it, it's kind of funny that I use the term us because us is actually really me <laughs> because I don't have an us. <laughs> so um, anyway, but it's it just sounds better if I say us as opposed to give me a like because that sounds pretty... Um, pretty self-absorbed. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, be, be that as it may, um, hope everybody's okay. And I'm going to uh, now uh, bring in and introduce uh, this week's guest. And by the way, happy 2021. Um, everything has been so crazy this week that I almost forgot to wish everybody a happy 2021. It's now here we are in our first week of 2021. And I think uh, better things are on the horizon. So hang in there. Um, anyway, my guest, uh, uh, Andrew Bishop, composer, saxophonist, teacher, um, dabbler of many, many things. Um, uh, it's a super pleasure uh, for me to have Andy on, and I'm super glad that he, he said yes to being on the show. Um, I've known Andy for many years, um, and so I think you'll, you'll enjoy um, our our conversation you're getting to know him and his music a bit so let me bring andy into our scene here as i switch views and there he is um andy how are you doing tonight pretty good pretty good yeah no it's it's great it's great to see you it's great to get to talk about music and um yeah so yeah, yeah. i mean you know we talked a little bit in the in the uh I guess in the in the uh, green room, if you will, <laughs> right? The the Zoom green room. We talked a little bit of. Obviously, it's it's hard for us not to, you know, as as human beings living in the universe, hard for us not to, of course, be aware of the what's happening in our current um, climate. Uh, and uh, but but we we won't address it other than to say that we know that it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that everyone else knows that it's happening. You can, you can find out all, all, all you want about it on, on your interwebs. Um, but, um, but yeah, um, how's, uh, uh, and I, I, I'm a former, so for those of you who don't know this, uh, I am uh, a um, former um, Wolverine. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan and, uh, for a couple of years, got my master's degree, and that's actually where I where I met where I met Andy, um, and uh, Andy um, uh, through a circuitous way um, ended up back in Ann Arbor, right? So now you're professor uh, over at uh, at the School of Music, um, and uh, you know we can talk. Obviously, we'll, we'll 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 get to some of the some some of that in the conversation um, as we go forward, but um, I know. Again, like I said, I've known you for many years, um, and so I know things about you that probably people at home don't know. Uh, but I also know that you grew up in uh, in Kansas. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's true. I um, <clears throat> Wichita, Kansas, was uh, you know a, the sort of the main place. I did all my schooling there. I, I went to uh, Wichita State University, um, which is where I met. Uh, 
just an incredible composer teacher named Walter Mays. Um, I was studying, I was essentially, you know, at the time I was, I considered myself primarily a jazz player, mm -hmm. but there were so few schools where you could really just study jazz at that time. Right. Um, that I was uh, essentially, I started out as a classical clarinet performance major mm -hmm. um, and then um, switched over to classical saxophone. And then um, I had Walter Mays for my, for my theory classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, you know, was one of those kind of life altering college experiences, getting to know him and mm -hmm. just how excited he was about the musical world and composition and, and, uh, and you know, it just that. really, exactly. It just really opened my, my eyes. And so I started studying with him and then, um, very, got very interested in, in composition and composing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to, before we, uh, before we, uh, uh, dive into a little bit of kind of what, uh, cause that's actually one of the things I asked is like, what, what got you to this funny point of being a composer? Um, uh, because it's uh, it's rarely one of those things where where in the um, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, as fireman or you know, president, <laughs> composer is not usually on the list. Right. Um, yeah. So you know, we'll, we'll, I, I kind of like to fill in a little bit of that of that. Um, oh, hey, David. Um, by the way, uh, if you anyone watching have comments or questions uh, for uh, our guest, uh, my guest and uh or about the, any of the music or what we're talking about or whatever it is uh please uh chime in i will be monitoring the the chat say hello even if you don't have a question say hello let us know you're watching it's always nice to to hear from the folks so david Gaines, uh who's a regular uh listener um and so david david went to northwestern so you know there's that but uh <laughs> sorry david you know, I like that too. The, the, yeah. Um, but anyway, he's a composer. He's always uh, so. Thanks for for watching, David. Um, so, uh, well, what? I guess t I have two questions uh, uh, about sort of digging into sort of your early mm -hmm. the the early period of Bishop. Um, the, what is the the uh, what was it like growing up in Kansas? Um, uh, you know, it is it is literally the heartland of America. Um, and uh, if anybody uh, out in the audience have, have never driven or been to states like Kansas or Nebraska, Oklahoma, I mean, it's there's they're really beautiful in their in their own way. Even if you're used to mountains, you have these the the, the sky and the expansiveness of the prairie and the and the and the farms and everything like this. Um, so it's kind of, you know, I always think that when, when people, um, pe people take something of the geography that they um, uh, were raised in with them, even if they're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I'm, I'm wondering two things. Well, one is like, I want to know, like, what were some of your first musical experiences? Like what, what got you beginning down this road of, music and second um um what was it like growing up in kansas and 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 i, I guess you can you can tie this in later if you want to is that has the, the the experience of basically having that um natural surrounding in kansas how is that you know mm -hmm. how does that impact you as a musician and as a as an artist those are those are great questions um well, um, my, uh, my parents were really like music fans. Um, they were especially into, to like old big band, mm -hmm. um, kind of pops orchestra mm -hmm. sort of music. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and so my mom would take me to a lot of concerts and things like that. Um, I had an incredible high school band director named Marla Weber, who just, you know, really was very inspiring and, and uh, kind of got me then ultimately connected with a lot of the people at the university. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Even when I was in high school, people like Craig Owens and Tom Fowler mm -hmm. um, were, were two teachers of mine really early on. Um, one of them was like a jazz. Craig Owens really was the one who 
got me composing. He was, he was, um, you know, had, had, we we had a small group that kind of got coached by him Mm -hmm. and, um, he was like, you guys need to write, you know, start writing your own music. And so we started, you know, kind of writing our own tunes in high school, just Mm -hmm. kind of jazz ish tunes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, Tom Fowler was my, 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 my saxophone teacher and, um, at the time and, yeah. And so I just really kind of got surrounded by them. And then, the, you know, the sort of the next thing, you know, you're, I, here's, here's a kind of a joke, but it's actually also, it's also true. Um, you know, that the, there's always that, that kind of that joke that's levied about how fat, how long it takes fashion to make its way from the coasts into the Midwest. <laughs> right. And yeah. um, one of the things that was, I was a beneficiary of in, in a lot of ways was that, um, when I was still in high school, you know, there were, there were still lots of big band gigs. Mm -hmm. And, and so like, as a high school student, I was, I was gigging all the time. And, and, um, and, you know, it was like, wow, making a living doing this, you know, or I may, I shouldn't say making a living, I'm making some money doing this. Right. 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 right, right, right. Um, and, uh, one funny, story about the kind of the, the the aspect of the prairie is um i we used to uh we used to spend some summers out in russell kansas playing the rodeos out there actually mm. too mm-hmm. and we used to stay at there was this motel that we'd stay at and you could literally see it was like the ocean you could see the curvature of the earth it was right so flat, because it was so you know? right yeah yeah so definitely you know that 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 really brought me along um there was a, it was small, but a pretty robust musical scene, you mm-hmm. know, in, in Wichita. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, yeah. And, and a lot of elder musicians kind of welcomed me in and yeah. pretty soon I was doing a lot of gigs and, yeah. and um, when it came time for college, I looked lots of different places, but which, which state was at the time was very much the, 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 the in state music school. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really, really, yeah. really strong music school. Mm-hmm. And so, um, although I <clears throat> had still at that time planned to be a double major in, uh, in business. Uh, okay. but that, la- that only lasted for about a semester. Okay. And then, uh, was that, yeah was that right. uh, was that was that just i mean did you have an, a nascent interest or was it just kind of like well if this music thing doesn't work out it was kind of that um which which Utah state had a big entrepreneurship program ah, which was right. kind of interesting to me and mm-hmm. um and so i thought well okay you know good music school good entrepreneurship school i'll, I'll, I'll do both of these things yeah, and right. and um uh, but it was really, you know, once, once I kind of got into the music school thing and was, like I said, I was, I was gigging and, right. you know, right. um, do, doing a lot of that kind of stuff. I, I yeah. it, it just kind of ultimately sort of took over and, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, yeah. I so. want to, uh, you know, I've had, um, in my own personal experience and, and knowing a lot of musicians, uh, um, not just you know composers, performers, composer performers. Um, uh, it, it almost seems like regardless of style, but especially especially in the jazz world. Um, and 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 at the time, uh, you know, you and I are relatively contemporaneous. So you know, during our formative years, it was still possible if you had some chops, like you know, as a, as a teenager, it was possible to play gigs. It was possible to make money. Now, I mean, you weren't going to, you know, buy a million dollar house on that money, but there were gigs. I mean, there were live gigs. I mean, everything from, you know, the usual sort of GB wedding gigs to, to actually playing, you know, like playing out. Um, and, um, uh, the last, show I had, I had the vibraphonist Joe Locke um, was my guest. And Joe, you know, when he was talking about his formative years as a, as a, um, you know, getting into playing um, mallet percussion, getting the vibraphone um, and, and just, he just was drawn to it. And by 15, 16 years old, he was, you know, he was cutting it on the bandstand. He was actually making, you know, playing and making money and learning on the bandstand and he 
says, and a lot of people do, and I'm curious what your take is, take is on this because you and I both went on to get advanced degrees and teach at universities. Um, the value of learning on the job and what that means to a musician, uh, both at the time that the musician is experiencing it, but also kind of down the road, uh, I mean, how 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 was that for you in terms of like your overall musical education? Because like the way that Joe and other musicians will frame it is that you can learn a lot of stuff on the bandstand, and it's usually by making mistakes and being told by the by your elders, "Don't do that, man," like or yeah. right, yeah. like yep, yep. <laughs> and 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 like learning your core, like learning chords, like learning like you know these are these this is you know these are you know you play over these changes or whatever it is or learning all the tunes right, um you, it's like you don't just study it like in a class out of the real book, um you do it because somebody calls out a tune and it's like oh shit I got to play this tune now I don't know it, <laughs> and, right, and it's like well boom you know count off and and have it so i, I guess uh, i i guess what I, it's a long way of saying like how was your experience learning by trial by fire and um how would you say that that informed you as a at both as a euro a musician and also as an as an educator as somebody who kind of teaches from a more you know at the university it's a soft land there's a softer landing for musicians right you can make mistakes and no one like like in your recital even just basically your friends that just get yeah. to hear you you know I, i'm just yeah. curious your your thoughts on that de de definitely um and i i really i try to i i actually try to hustle those kinds of experiences for my students still, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. because I, I just think it's so it's just so valuable um you know the the other thing that i had in, in wichita was um a really great music theater program you know and so i was playing yeah, pit orchestra yeah, things you yeah. know like all the time yeah. and it's like uh okay this show has piccolo i i don't know how to play piccolo so i need to learn <laughs> like how to play piccolo, you know? <laughs> right. um and um so there was there's definitely a, a lot of that i think um it, it's it, it's a balance because you can also get into a lot of doing the same old stuff over right. and over again right. um right. but um you know, there was a time there where I just played every gig that was, I mean, I played in polka bands, I mm -hmm. played music theater, mm -hmm. I played, you know, and at the same time, I was, you know, learning new music at, uh, at, at, at school. And, and um, so I, you know, I think I definitely having that experience was, was really incredible for me. I mean, it, I feel very fortunate in a lot of ways that I had only one non-music job in my entire life. And, and that was, I worked at a bicycle shop mm. in, in high school in my first year of college. And then studying in my second year of college, I was either gigging or I was teaching saxophone lessons. Um, and I was, you know, able to, to sustain myself and, mm -hmm. It was kind of through that experience as well that I, I discovered that, you know, teaching was something that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And so I, I knew that, um, well, and at the time I was still technically a music education major, although that then also fell to the wayside. Yeah. Um, um, after, you know, a couple of visits to some schools i was like i'm not sure i'm cut out for this i probably sure. could do it now sure. you know which yeah. is the funny thing but i remember at the time thinking oh there's no there's no way i could i could i could do this and, yeah um, yeah so you know that that kind of looking towards that university job um i knew was a place where i was going to get that kind of fulfilling experience of just kind of continuing to keep my you know, having to explain things just as was as was always really fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, right. so, yeah, no, I, I knew uh, even though I was doing all of this, this performing and that that teaching was definitely something that was that was good that you knew early on was I knew early on that was something that I was that, that I was right going to be a, be a part of what I did. So. Right, right. Um, all right. I, yeah, because I will we'll pick up on maybe like that that 
because I'm fascinated by this sort of aspect of of how, and as you point out, as you said, or uh, that you try to, the, the aspect of learning, if you will, live, right? Live learning, if you will. I guess it's it's what it's what educators speak called um, experiential learning, right? Yeah. Um, that, <laughs> right. And and the reason why Andrew laughed so much about that is because he really knows he and I both know what that means <laughs> when we're on assessment committee, assessment committee work. But um, that being said, um, like the ultimate experiential learning is learning on the job, uh, learning, you know, just literally doing it. Um, but uh, so we'll cycle back to that because because obviously teaching is a major part of, of your life and how you map that into mm -hmm. into your teaching. But um, all right, so you're you're you 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 go to college, right? You you find out that music business or entrepreneurship kind of isn't a thing. Uh, music, it kind of that the, the sort of traditional music ed route isn't a thing. Um, you, as you said earlier, you go in um, with a focus in 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 jazz performance. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, what? Well, actually, before we talk about that. Why jazz? Uh, it was the, the the two people I mentioned, Craig Owens and, uh -huh. and Tom Fowler. Uh -huh. um, they they just really they really brought me into it. Um, and um, you know, I would go down to hear them play, and I would just it was just it was the coolest thing that I had ever seen. You know, and I played mm -hmm. the saxophone. You know, and it was like, oh, okay, well. Um, and so you know, you start digging into records and learning the music and next thing you know you got a couple of gigs you learn some tunes you know and uh, right so that definitely it, it was a pretty organic um Dis uh, discovery discovery yeah for sure yeah um, yeah and um yeah i think you know there was just something about um you know there was just there was a lot of really like I said, it was a small community, but a lot of great musicians in the area. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, they just kind of immediately took me under their wing. And, mm -hmm. and I, I really, I really appreciated that. It's something I try to manufacture, you know, for, for my students or mm -hmm. younger students today. Um, it was a pretty robust, um, um, African-American community in Wichita that really, you know, was incredibly welcoming. And mm -hmm. it was, it was so rewarding to kind of get to, you know, experience a kind of a cultural element that it wasn't necessarily, my, my dad was, I don't know if you know this, but my dad's a, was a, um, passed about nine years ago, but was a Baptist minister. And I, uh -huh. I, I really appreciated yeah. the fact he, yeah. he was so he was so excited that I was, you know, going and playing these gospel gigs or you mm -hmm. know, these kinds of things. So it was mm -hmm. it was uh mm -hmm. yeah, just just kind of a very small city, but a really wonderful but, and and inviting and just I think I think it is that that just kind of that feeling welcomed. Yeah. Also being schooled but feeling welcomed, you know, right. there are different <laughs> levels of this, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Right. Like, but, uh, right. Um, you know, um, Glenn Holmes, who was a really, he was also a composer studied at, um, he studied where he was a, he had done a master's in composition at Wichita state with, with, uh, Walter Mays, but okay, uh, he yeah. had also, he had also studied with, maybe university of miami of ohio um, um mm -hmm. and he was really into classical composition and, and mm -hmm. jazz and mm -hmm. and uh you know he was a guy another guy who kind of took me under his, he's an incredible bass player mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. took me under his wing and but i just remember one time he called me for a gig and you know like i i showed up and i had my real book and he's like you're not going to use that tonight Andrew, we're going to play everything, you know, whatever tunes, you know, by memory are the tunes you're going to, we're going to play. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. No. So, and then at the end of the gig, he's like, Hey, Andrew, you need to learn some tunes. <laughs> it's like, that was his, that was his way of finding out uh, what, what your real book was up here. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So anyway, just, just really um, incredible um, 
incredible musicians and and um you know really welcoming community mm-hmm. from a, from a, a lots of different stand, vantage points so mm-hmm. yeah um so your 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 slippery descent into composition that uh you mentioned it started with just writing some tunes right um initially and yep. uh uh and then your mentors started mentoring you and but what at what point uh did you think or feel i guess in your heart and and not that you um because you do many things you're a multifaceted musician so you know i don't want to say that you're primarily a composer because you do you, you do all these things um mm-hmm. but what kind of what 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 got you down the road to the point where you felt like hey this is really something i want to do this is like really something i i need to explore this i need to figure this out yeah so uh, yeah i was just writing little tunes here and there you mm-hmm. know nothing nothing especially mm-hmm. um big um and um i was in a the- my theory class with with um this composer that i mentioned walter mays mm-hmm. He had uh, he had studied with with Cage and I think maybe Penderecki and um, um, a few other people and his theory classes were just so they were just magical. I mean, mm. it was just like he you know he would just basically it was just him at the board just creating these kind of you know landscapes out of a particular concept you know and sort of unlocking it's like okay well this is how Brahms did this or this is how Mm -hmm. and I I just was I I was so kind of taken you know that I, I started to kind of go in and check out some of his music and you know then I finally got the courage to ask him you know for some composition lessons Mm -hmm. and he gave me a few small assignments and he, you know, a few weeks later, he goes, you know, Andrew, I, th- I think, I think this is, this might be a place for you. Um, huh. yeah. And um, I was continuing to play, you know, and both classical saxophone rep and, and, um, mm-hmm. um, uh, and be a jazz player and freelance musician. But mm-hmm. I, I really, really, there was a period there probably in my junior and senior year of college where I, I really did shift my focus to thinking of myself primarily as a composer yeah. and yeah. looking at going to graduate school in composition, in composition. not yeah. in other areas. Right. Um, right. And, um, you know, and I, I say that, um, you know, there was probably both both through the graduate, those last two years, my graduate school experience, which was, you know, around five years, both Mm. masters and Mm -hmm. DMA at Mm -hmm. Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then, um, um, and then for about three years after that, maybe even four years Mm -hmm. really was, I, I very much viewed myself as this, this was what I was doing. I wanted to write orchestral work, string quartets, you know, right. That was kind of that, yeah world yeah and um ultimately you know it's just kind of funny how i you know it's it's i I feel very lucky um you know that i've been able to keep that going but a lot of i ended up starting to kind of get a lot of attention as a player you right, know right and, and the other interesting thing about that too is that i think people got uh interested in sort of hiring me as they knew even if it wasn't to play my compositions they were mm-hmm. like oh yeah andrew's this kind of interesting composer improviser he can play new music and he can also play changes and he can uh-huh, read uh-huh. complicated music and right. and so it just it just kind of veered in that direction and, right. Um, right. Um, um, and uh, I still, you know, still love all of that stuff. I've been kind of diving back in, in you know, kind of, I kind of truck back in here and there. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, de- definitely a, a, a lot of my life sort of veered more towards a performing yeah. Um, yeah. landscape. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I've never stopped composing. Mm-hmm. So I always 
gearing around. I, I think one of the things that that experience taught me too was that um, this sort of being an artist kind of in a limbo state gave me a lot of freedom maybe mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. if i had just gotten a job in just like like opposition just to do the one know. right the one yeah the one trick thing right you know, like the one folk right and so the, ultimately you know the, the 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 department that i end up teaching in now which i'm currently the chair of the mm -hmm. department of jazz and contemporary improvisation here at michigan you know is a very holistic, you know, yes, Thelonious Monk and mm -hmm. Charles Mangus and Duke mm -hmm. Ellington mm -hmm. and George Russell, but also mm -hmm. Bartok and the mm -hmm. Beatles and, mm -hmm. you know, um, funk and um, right. So it's, 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 it just ended up kind of being a right fit ultimately yeah. for where I ended up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and that also too was um did you work did you study with albright when you were at michigan I, at all? I did not get a chance to study formally with with bill um uh you know had, he was on sabbatical that once that yeah that it was semester. like it, it, it was weird when the uh, i know when i was there there were like a balkan was on sabbatical for like like a whole year and right. then albright was on sabbatical yeah for another for like a semester and yeah and uh, i i don't know it was like you know everybody i mean i understand people i'm go on sabbatical, sabbaticals more power to them but sometimes you know if you're if you roll the dice at the wrong time right yeah. you as a student and and as a master's student you got two years right so yeah. you, you, it's yeah. like you know um but yeah no uh uh i didn't get a chance to study with bill but i know people who have uh studied with bill and have um, um, there's a, there's a tremendous, I, and I, I, by the way, he was super, uh, I, I will say this, like, uh, uh, whatever people may think about Bill from the outside, he was tremendously supportive of me and I'll never forget that. I will never forget the summer between my first and second year. And, and you'll appreciate this story. Um, so when I went, I went out, when I went to Michigan, I made a decision to not go to Yale, uh, and I, to, to go to Michigan. And actually I went there because at that time I thought, oh, you know, like Balkan was the draw. Mm -hmm. And I knew people who had gone to Michigan, like in the seventies. And of course the school was, was top rated institution, whatever, but you know, so, um, and I went there kind of. At the last minute, I decided, and I, I didn't really have like a financial, the first year master student didn't have a financial package. And so out of state. So, um, and you, you know, the school of music is not cheap. Uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, and, and what, what uh, I'll, Bill gave me copy work. Mike Doherty gave me copy work. Um, I got some funny stories about, about copying Michael's pieces and having him call me at like one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, but that's another, it is, I mean, it, there's nothing salacious. It's just funny Michael yeah. Doherty stories. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but Bill, who was chair, uh, of the comp department at that time. And, um, because, um, uh, George Wilson, uh, you know, he was retiring. Right. Yeah, so, and I'd study with George actually the first semester I was there, but anyway, um, I call, I, 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 I called him and I said, you know, Bill, I, Mr. Albright, I didn't call him Bill then. Uh, I, I don't know if I can come back. I mean, I, I mean, I, I might have to take a leave because it's just like, like I'm trying to figure out like, where am I going to get the money? Um, and he said, um, so don't make any decisions. Uh, uh just hang tight. Uh, I'll call you in a few days. This was like July. Two days later, probably, I think maybe exactly two days later, he calls me up and he says, I got you an assistantship. You want to teach composition for non-majors? And I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly I had an assistantship and I was teaching with, with, uh, um, uh, you know, with Steve <laughs> yeah, right, in the bell yeah. tower. And that was, that was great. It was super fun. And I learned a lot doing that, 
but I will never forget that he like just I don't know where he found it. I don't because I'm I'm sure everything had been given out already. I don't know where he got the money. I don't know who he That's called. That's incredible. Yeah, that now he he actually many of them did those kinds of things yeah. for me when I was a student. And, but one of the things about Albright, of course, was he was a tremendous pianist and yes. organist. You know, phenomenal. And, yeah. And so he was also somebody that was kind of. I, I remember I was like, well, you know, I, I feel like I need to concentrate more just on doing this one thing. He's like, no, he goes, Andrew, this is this. I think this is kind of what makes you interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and it was just like one, yeah. one of those moments of like, oh, wow. OK, like here, here's a guy who's like composer that I really admire. Mm -hmm. um, who's telling me I'm on the right track. I, yeah. I, should, I should keep playing. I should keep practicing. I yeah. Should keep, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Composing and and just kind of see what <laughs> see what happens. And uh, yeah. Volcom did the same. Doherty also, yeah. Um, all, all of those those guys were incredibly supportive. Yeah, um, yeah. So really, really appreciative. And, and it's interesting that 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 um, that Bill Albright would 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 tell you that because that's 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 the right thing to say, <laughs> not just because it's the expedient thing to say. And I, um, yeah. I, and actually, when the, this actually will probably be a nice segue to play some of your music, but sure. Um, uh, but you know. The the history actually the normative the normative uh, uh, state for a composer is as a composer performer. Yeah. It's not just the composer that sits at a drafting table all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I know that in the twentieth century, and I don't know, maybe some musicologist out there can correct me if there are examples in the 18th and 19th centuries. But in the 20th century, when you think about like the, the, the heavy hitters uh, in the 20th century, who are usually acknowledged as the heavy hitters, whatever you want to, however you want to define that, um, they either played at a super high level or played and conducted, right? As a conducting was kind of another performative outlet. Um, um, and the teaching was kind of the side hustle right that was the side gig yeah. um and then somewhere in the mid-century it kind of uh things kind of became the, the the scholarly aspect of sort of like the theory musicology aspect became more folded into composition to the extent where and, and this is this is not a um um i mean not pre this is not me preaching or it's not a polemic on my part but uh, or nor nor is it uh, my uh, uh, true of every instance. But it became a kind of thing when you and I were in school. It wasn't expected for us to be performers. Absolutely, like we weren't su we weren't supposed to. Uh, there was no nothing against it, but we weren't supposed to be gigging. Right now, but if you think about like one of our classmates, Derek Bramell, phenomenal clarinet player. Yeah, I mean, you know, equally, Absolutely. If, 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 if nobody, if he stopped writing music, he could have a continue to have a career as a clarinet player, chamber yeah. music, concertos, yeah. whatever. Right. Um, I mean, you know, and, and other like um, even uh, people who don't have the careers with that kind of luminosity, like like um, like Derek, like um, like Evan House, for example, yeah. or um, yeah. I just name, name our classmates, name the classmates from from the early 90s. And they all basically performed i performed i kind of sucked actually at playing trumpet um and i stopped for a while and because i realized i really wasn't any good at it um i loved playing but i wasn't good at it um and uh developed my piano chops i'm not really a good pianist but i improv i improvise that's my outlet is sort of you know um, improvisation and electronics and that sort of thing so you know i think like the fact that you found or i shouldn't say you found you just kind of reconnected that dot that was always there that thread that was always there where you weren't going to have to give up necessarily your playing right it wasn't about that and it made you no less of a composer because you were playing you know jazz gigs or whatever right yeah no you it's, know? It's, it's it's a really interesting i definitely saw myself at the time, you know, that we were doing our masters, I saw myself in that in that mold of I'm going to be a theory comp person, right? And and mm -hmm. kind of this, you know, maybe I'll play a little bit, but mostly I'm going to be this this kind of person. And and mm -hmm. um, um, I was having this conversation with 
a student of mine who's a double major the other day too. And he's like, well, you know, can I, can I do both of these things? I said, yes, you can. It's just, the thing is, it's just going to take longer mm. to do both of these, you know, like mm-hmm. that, that's, that's, it's a mm-hmm. longer haul. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, no, it's, uh, it is interesting though. It's, I, 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 you used a word earlier that I use a lot to describe my sort of musical path, which is secure, secure this, you know, it's yeah, right. And yeah. this kind of weaving road of, sure. Okay. Now I'm doing this and now I'm kind of doing this and now I'm kind of doing this. Right. And right. We'll kind of see what happens, I guess. Right. Right. As long as it's all interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. kind of like the, yeah. that's like the main thing. And I, I think, and, uh, and then we'll, pl- uh, we'll, we'll play some music. Um, and, and we can keep sort of talking about this because this is actually, I think about this quite often. Um, I think about the, the nature of sort of, uh, you know, being a composer and composition pedagogy and this sort of thing, right. Cause as teachers, right. We're both teachers. So yeah. I think about these yeah. things all the time. And I think about how to best serve my students and how to yeah. advise them and, you know, um, and, and all of, all of the things that we do, um, in two, you know, but, uh, you know, I just think that the, and I, and, and maybe, I mean, Michigan's always been this sort of example of, of a school, uh, that, um, doesn't shy away from these notions of like having like multi, multiple hats, where a lot of the faculty wear multiple hats in terms of like, you know, like it's not, um, so like your department, for example, like you just mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's an apartment that sort of, you said holistic, right? It's holistic. Yeah. It's a, ecle- yeah. it's eclectic. It's, um, it's just like whatever's interesting, that's cool. And, um, and it's like, you know, it could be, you know, like you said, it could be bar talk. I, David Gaines said, uh, he commented, cause when you said this, he said, bar talk and the Beatles, he said, nice. Right. You know, I mean, sure. Yeah. Why not? You know, you can find interesting things in both and maybe put them together, you know, and, and so, um, uh, to, I, I, I just say, I think there are the, the, the trend of the composer, the composer theorist isn't necessarily a bad thing because, because we only have 24 hours in a day. So if you have a composer theorist who also happens to like be a, like a killer player, that's a kind of rare thing because you because your playing chops have to be at such a high level already so that you don't have to practice as much every day to kind of keep them at a high level, right? Like you have to kind of have it under your fingers, right? But if yeah. you don't, you got to work at it and then suddenly, you know, you're not going to write your theory paper right? and, and get that string quartet written right yeah, so exactly you know so like wow. you know that that's a lot of work like like you can people can do it and you know the earlier you do it the the better off you are um in that in that in that realm um but i really think that there's something lost if if a, if and i and t- tell me if 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 this is kind of what you usually prescribe if you will to your students i think there's something lost if a composer isn't sort of actively making music in some other outlet I, I definitely in in the jazz area I'm I'm pretty adamant about I mean it's rare um, you know it's to be a exclusively a composer in this music um, mm-hmm. or right. in the improvised music world in right. general right. Um, there's more of a tradition that's, I, I, yeah yeah you know it's it's interesting too I think um, you mentioned the trump. I think the trumpet has got to be one of the harder ones to do that with too. You know, I'm I'm, I'm an idiot, man. I don't know. I, it's because I heard Miles, and then I was oh, stupid. Man. I was stupid enough to think that I could be like Miles. Yeah. And yeah. guess what? I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and not I, Freddie you know, Hubbard or you know whatever you know. Yeah. And I'm lucky that I spent. You know this. This was one thing that that uh, I. I I'm not very good at patting myself on the back, but I did do a lot of homework on my instrument early on enough mm, mm. that I can keep it together pretty easily. Mm. And not not to diss the saxophone, but of course, um, yeah. you know, but it's it's definitely it's a it's a I think saxophone, maybe piano, maybe guitar. I, I know maybe, where you're going with this. Yeah, they're are, composers' are be, instruments. Yeah, they're going to be a little be more forgiving. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Than tuba or, or, <laughs> right. or trumpet right. or 
and brass instruments, I think, are especially difficult. Um, so, um, although people somehow, they, they some people too, do so, and yeah. more power to them. And it could be, you know, I, I know if I didn't practice, if I, if uh, seriously, I, I am really, this is almost no joke, but when I was playing and when I worked my tail off to just get kind of adequate on the instrument for a while, if I so much as took a day off or maybe two days off just to cool it man it was like i lost three months yeah no it's it was yeah. like suddenly like i lost like a fifth off my range and like mm -hmm. my tone was shittier and you know it was like and i just i kept doing it and you know the definition of insanity is you keep you know yeah. expecting a different result when you keep trying the same thing over and over again yeah um so um oh David Gaines, again. Thanks, David, for, for watching and commenting. Uh, David said, Hindemith and Genesis are more me, but I love Bartok and the Beatles, too. Good. Uh, and he says, hey, nothing wrong with the tuba. David actually is a euphonium player. Impre that's impressive. Yes. <laughs> yes, he's a euphonium player. And he also speaks fluent Esperanto. That's another oh, wow. thing, uh, one of his things. So uh, That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I... Um... Yeah, I can I can get my like on woodwind instruments. I can get my sounds back pretty quickly. Um, mm. So uh, can I let you in on a little secret? Yeah, the little <laughs> don't hate me, but the little secret is for a little while in like the early no mid O's or uh -huh. aughts, whatever whatever uh -huh. people want to call them, right? I I wanted to pick up a I wanted to pick up an instrument again, not just the piano. I wanted to kind of like diversify a bit, and so. I thought, well, what was what's the instrument that I could pick up relatively quickly and maintain without a whole lot of effort? <laughs> you want to take a guess at which instrument I chose? I I have no idea. Saxophone. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know. Um, my, my, now my... I was I, here. Here's my mistake. I will say I was right and wrong. I was right because I have a friend who's a, who's a composer also, who's a, uh, Pete Farmer, who's a, also a fine saxophone player. And he used to be a trumpet player, and he switched. He's a composer, and he says, man, if you're going to try to play, you should play saxophone. Don't touch, don't ever touch the trumpet. <laughs> okay, but the problem was is that I ended up getting a soprano to learn. Oh, on. there you go. And, yeah. uh, for, okay, for folks at home who might not understand, like, kind of, you know, uh, Andrew's laughing because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, there are multiple, there are many uh, members of the saxophone family um, from soprano, sopranino actually, the higher, the, from high to low, so, so sopranino, soprano, um, alto, tenor. Um, there's the C melody, there's the uh, baritone, and then the the uh, bass baritone, right? Is it the bass baritone? Contra, uh, contra, uh, contra, 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 contra bass. Um, and just like low brass instruments, the, 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 like a baritone, like a lot of kids in like fifth grade start on like Barry or tenor because it's relatively easier to get a tone and to also keep yeah. your intonation. But soprano, man, oh, I, yeah, once one, a bear. it's a bear. So I, I, I failed even at that. <laughs> anyway, well, my, my, my colleague, um, I, I, I hope you won't, uh, you smirched me for saying this, but my colleague, Tim McAllister, who I sometimes oh, teach. Oh, Tim, with, yeah. Yeah, he's fabulous. Summers, he's incredible. Yeah. Um, he said, you know, it's a, it's a really wonderfully designed instrument. <laughs> and you got to give props to Adolf Saxophone. Yeah. For, it's Adolf Sax for, for creating the saxophone and, and, uh, and you know, creating an instrument that was, you know, it had definitely has. Uh, I mean, it's, it has its quirks and it has mm -hmm. its challenges. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely feel your pain though. As a trumpet player, I think it's a the brass players. I think it's a much harder. Yeah, it's a harder climb for for, for the kind of thing that we were talking about maintaining yeah. that. Yeah. Um. Hey, man. Let's 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 play a little music. Um, cool. Uh, I mean, we have um, a couple of your chamber pieces, and we have a tune. Um, you have yeah, any? Yeah, I'm I'm, 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 I'm kind of wide open. Um, you know, the the piece I did for Ellery Esquan might be a good one, just because it's sort of a mm -hmm. 
some things I've been doing recently um, that kind of combine a, a lot of different places. Um, and um, again, this is something I kind of fell into very organically where improvisers started to ask me to write them kind of pieces mm -hmm. for chamber music mm -hmm. that they could just kind of play in the texture. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, something as a younger musician, you know, who was, who was an improviser, um, I was always really, in, you know, it's like you, you start hearing these pieces by Steve Reich and Bartok and Stravinsky and you're like, wow, I'd, lo I'd love to play over those or. Right. Um, you start you thinking know, as a, as an improviser, you start thinking, yeah. well, that's a cool chord change. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, yeah. I think, and um, I don't know if you knew this, I'm sure you knew him uh, or know him, um, but I had, you know, one lesson with Rand Blake. Yeah. And, yeah. And, <laughs> right. and, and, and he would, yeah. you know, like he would just, click on a Weber and string quartet and say, all right, play. Um, and um, it was, I just thought that was such a cool activity. And so it just some, something that, um, you know, later some some musician friends of mine just started to say, you know, I thought, I'd love to do some kind of piece with like, like a Perot ensemble or, a, um, you know, string quartet and just, just you write out everything mm -hmm. and then I'll just improvise over it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's kind of the genesis of this piece mm -hmm. um, called Into the Fabric, which was just me kind of thinking about kind of creating these sort of quilts, you know, that you could just kind of kind blow over, blow over and yeah. sort of and not not necessarily chord changes or or but more just kind of landscapes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with um, um, with uh, very few instructions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh um, I, I plan to do this piece at some point, um, myself, um, but El Ellery was the one who, um, asked for it. He's mm -hmm. just one of my favorite saxophonists yeah. sort of performances yeah. with, with Ellery Eskeline. So, yeah, cool. All right. Well, let's uh, cue this up. We have a video, um, uh, for those at home who would like to see a score, we do have a, I have a score that we can show if you have any questions about, you know, I'd like to know what happened there. We can always show that. But I think the watching the performance is more interesting than me trying to flip through a score. <laughs> so we'll cue up that video and um, meet back and, and talk about that in a second. Let me flip over to the music view and we'll meet up when we're finished.
Um, yeah, man, that was great. Uh, let me uh, bring us into the scene here. Um, I'll uh, look and see if in a few minutes, I'll look and see if we had any uh, comments or, or, or sure. questions from whoever's uh, watching uh, live. Um, so uh, we, we had some, uh, for the audience at home, uh, Andrew and I could, could, could also talk a little bit behind kind of the scenes while you guys were, 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 were listening to the music. And um, there were a few things that, that, uh, that we talked about that, that we think would be interesting to, to talk about with, with, with the shared audience. And um, so uh, kind of backtracking uh, a bit uh, from our, our conversation, um, one of the things that I think makes this piece very successful. So, um, so again, the string quartet is, uh, completely written out. Um, and then there's, there's this space, uh, for the soloist, the, the tenor sax soloist. And so, um, a lot of times these can be, and, 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 and Andrew knows this, I know this, we've, we've had experiences like this where, where when you put improvisation into an otherwise completely written out vibe that isn't necessarily a, uh, following a kind of a stylistic, uh, blueprint, something like a jazz tune or a pop tune or, or something like this nature, it can be very unsuccessful, uh, because, uh, not because of really the fault of any one player, but, um, the, the coordination musically between the written out stuff and the improvised stuff, it can be like the improviser is in a completely different room, uh, not even paying attention to what's going on or whatever. But here, um, the, uh, this is really a, a I think a, both a, a compliment to the composer and also a compliment to the soloist in that, um, it didn't feel when I was listening, if I, if I didn't know that this was written out or not or, or that there was an improv improvisational aspect to it i wouldn't know it and i think that's where you want to that's the space you want to be because the because this the soloist is actually playing um um motives and ideas and melodies and and things of this responding essentially to the music as if the as if the quartet was essentially a rhythm section if you will uh uh you know um so I don't know if you want to, I mean, we talked a little bit about that, but I mean, uh, yeah. what do you, th how do you feel about that? And, and how did you, how did you plan that? Like, how, like, obviously that's your intention, but, but the execution is a different, different matter. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've certainly had some <laughs> disasters by the way, you know, so <laughs> Me too, yeah. you, you learn, you learn from those. Um, and, um, and I, I was joking around too, that of course, when I was a student, this is exactly the kind of work I was always warned against writing, which is, you know, always just plan everything out and make sure that, but, you know, I, I think just like, I think the, the one thing I'll say, like Ellery just really yeah. got inside the, you know, just like a, just like, you know, that, that great classical performer who really gets inside it. And the next thing, you know, it's like every note has a shape and mm -hmm. you're, you know, it's like mm -hmm. he, he dealt with it as if it was completely composed out. And, mm -hmm. and um, one of the, one of the other interesting things that we were talking about um, is um, this was one of those end of the semester kind of performances um, that, that we did Um and there was like an orchestra, there was an orchestra performance the, that, that night earlier. And so we had to do this late at night. And we actually did two versions of the piece. Hmm. And um, it was really, I, this one was definitely the one that like, I thought um, went really, really just in terms of timing and everything was, mm -hmm. had kind of the most mm -hmm. profound impact. Um, but the other performance was totally different and it was also really great to hear yeah. how Ellery yeah. dealt with that one. So, yeah. um, it was, uh, and, and then just as a, as a composer, you know, like I was just trying to kind of find some ways to kind of, you know, deal with form and texture mm. and accent and the string instruments sonically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm could you know allow somebody to do interesting things over it mm -hmm. and still have uh 
you know, like at least it, it would be interesting to see if this piece, and I don't know the answer to this, could hold up without the improviser or not. I did not intend for it to, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. I, I, it'd be interesting to hear mm -hmm. it without it. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, well, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was, um, you know, when I, 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 a lot of times pieces like this in this milieu, um tend to, like tend to make less of the backup band in the sense that there's there's the like you know usually like if it's uh like a, in a classical vein there'll be text just basically textures yeah like just textures i'm not talking yeah. about anything else like you you certainly and you use this word to describe it these these uh, um, uh, landscapes, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of a nice way of saying texture, but uh, but 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 you also had, you know, motivic ideas that you were developing and moving through the instruments and 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 you know, I mean, so it wasn't just you know, like a chord for like ten minutes or <laughs> you know this sort of thing yeah. where you know we've heard other pieces like that and it's not like they're bad. It's just like it's a it's a more ch it's a I think you threw the, to kind of use an analogy of like, a, you know, a dog fetching a stick, you threw the stick pretty far. Um, mm -hmm. You could have been more comfortable with it and thrown it a little closer um, and still generated, a, I think, a, a good piece, but you threw it further because I think to your question, if you take the soloist out, obviously I think it the piece will miss that aspect tremendously but yeah. at the same time it won't feel like it's just you know bah, <laughs> you know yeah, right. like yeah you know and right. and and the other thing is and this is of course a testament you and i've talked about this is that that a lot of times um uh non idiomatic uh, and and that's a funny word to use but but non yeah. sort of jazz like stylistic if you will improv mute improv pieces usually kind of fall in these little whole categories you know where it's like you give the soloist this space and suddenly it's like every note comes out every tambourine trill comes out or it's just like you know yeah. multiphonics are happening and it's just like it's just constant playing and it's just like a freak out um yeah. and and that's cool uh but um not what this piece needed but it could yeah. have very easily have devolved into into like that sort of world with a perhaps a a, a performer perhaps of some lesser abilities yeah. um and yeah. uh but i i but again it it, it like to, to my first point it holds together like a piece that that you wrote out every note on the saxophone mm -hmm. and i didn't hear the other version of it but i probably would have heard that and said the same thing yeah, yeah, and again, I think it just—it's a testament to just how incredibly, um, you know, deep El Ellery. Mm. It was just—I mean, he was just like—he's—he's he's an amazing musician mm. and mm. and thinker, and I just—I love having conversations with him. Mm -hmm. um, he's one of my favorite saxophonists too, mm. um, and so it just like I, you know, it was, it was fun to kind of imagine him, but I. I I definitely see this piece could be I, I I envisioned it in the hope that other players on other instruments might give it a shot too. You know, I'd love to hear it with a pianist or right. Right. Um, right. And again, it was like <laughs> it was exactly the kind of piece that I was always kind of um cautioned against cautioned against. Yeah. <laughs> right. you, you can't trust the players this way. And it's yeah, I'm sure that somewhere down the line and who knows it might be by me <laughs> you know a disastrous improv, improv improvised soloist may may um may be a part of this um uh it'll it, it'll be interesting yeah. um yeah. i think one of the other interesting things that that we were talking about during the break though too is that i think as the the dimensions of artistry expand, mm, mm -hmm, you know, like mm -hmm. like um, I, I Tegan, the main violinist there, is a really wonderful improviser, you know, mm -hmm. and she had just a sense of timing mm -hmm. would just be like, you know, that mm -hmm. just was really able to kind of propel everybody else in the in a, in a really good way. So um, 
um, I, I think we're, we're at an exciting crossroads. Kind of time. I, yeah. Yeah. It, um, having done pieces like this too, um, you know, sometimes as an improviser, you want di- the one thing that would be fun to figure out how to do next would be to find a way to create a landscape that could move, maneuver, be more fluid fluid yeah. and you could just say okay you know that the maybe we don't need the cello part there this performance mm-hmm. you know and so the cello chooses not to I, you know and so mm-hmm. I, i've been trying to kind of imagine what that might so that there would be some surprise so to speak right um, or or some variability um, with the other yeah the other yeah. parts yeah well let, yeah. let me um i'm gonna uh switch views here and uh, uh, go and find, uh, see if we have any uh, any comments or questions from our um, studio audience, as it were. Um, let me yeah. take a look here. Um, so, so David, David again, uh, again uh, says, um, difficult combo to make work, but it sounded quite organic. Some excellent improvising that worked really well with the strings. Uh, and then he goes on to say, guys, I have to run, uh, but this is a real treat. I always learn something. Bravo to you, Dr. Bishop. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, yeah. David. I appreciate thanks, you watching. Um, yeah, um, it's, it's one of those things that I, and I, then I, then, 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 then maybe we'll play, play the, play a tune. <laughs> we'll, yeah, sort of, yeah. Um, it, one of these things, um, um, oh, and I, we have another interesting question from Gabe, Gabriel McDermott, who's a young composer and a very fine uh, high, high school age composer going to college. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Gabriel, thanks for, for, for tuning in. I'll get to your question in one second. Um, you know, in, in, in back in our day, <laughs> and you know, it's sad, man, we're getting to the age where we are, where we're going to tell our students, we really did walk uphill to school both ways in I the know. snow. Right. Um, you know, we were joking, I think about like the card catalog, <laughs> you know, like, like, like kids these days have the internet. We had to go to the library. Um, yeah. uh, but, um, you know, the, the classical performer, um, the, the classical, perf- uh, the, 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 I guess the, the template, if you will, of the classical performer still largely remains, um, the, you know, um, excelling at at the technique of your instrument and then being devout to the urtext yeah um the the score right the cult of the score if you will um and of course there's a, a tremendous volume of literature that's wonderful to which a performer could spend a lifetime and never improvise necessarily and do do well we all know great performers that are that are out there having careers and and doing that it's, um yeah. Uh, but I think the, the template is, um, at least in some ways is changing. And you and I, you mentioned this, um, is that, um, more and more of the, cl- of quote unquote, and the air quotes are handy here, uh, c- a classical, uh, performance, uh, majors or s- students, people who are studying classical music are more interested in improvisation or at least branching out a bit and sort of like exploring different ways of, of approaching their instruments without giving up anything in terms of the, the, the usual um, sort of uh, devotion, if you will, to the notes. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And what that does for us, and I guess you can, you can, you can speak to this because um, you know, at, at the school of music, which is one of the top schools of music in the nation, you see more data points than I do. I'm a little liberal arts college. I don't see as many data points in this regard, especially over the last you know, 10 years. But, um, but I think it also helps us as composers, like, cause I often imagine um, spaces where improvisation is. I wrote you a piece a few years ago, actually, because I knew the reason why I wrote you that piece is because I knew I knew you were the person that could do it, and so I had to write a piece specifically for you. But it's like a piece that I couldn't imagine necessarily other people doing it unless they just they had that kind of skill set where they could read, and like kind of play between the cracks and also like play in the open spaces. Um, and so I don't I don't know if you want to say anything about 
Yeah, you know, um, by the way, that piece was a COVID casualty. I yeah. hope to do it this year. <laughs> Everything is a COVID casualty <laughs> this year, man. You know, but that's another story. Um, but one one of these hopefully, days. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully on the other side of this. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, um I, I think um it's it's hard for me to sort of judge it, it I'm you know basing my experience on what I what I do. Um but just knowing that definitely a lot of students were seeking me out and saying, you mm. know, like, I, I really want to, mm. you know, I want to understand this, you know, not because I'm going to improvise when I play a Feldman piece, but because, you yeah. know, like, I want to understand how right. to explore the instrument, you know, right. or, um, right. um, you know, so many of the, of the gestures you know, that, that we share with, with, with all kinds of, you know, mm. um, you know, in, in any kind of improvisational mm. form, you know, you're going to have similarities to, you know, um, I was doing a lot of Shoro playing for a while, mm. um, mm. you know, like Brazilian. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is basically like, Brazilian rhythm with with Chopin esque figuration, and it's like I can improvise in this zone because I have a lot of bebop vocabulary, you know. And it's like right. next thing you know, you you've got these kind of yeah yeah. And and so it's it's uh, I I I I really enjoy that. Um, again, it wasn't uh, wasn't necessarily a path I I saw you know that this was where things mm -hmm. were come together mm -hmm. but but you know it's 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 been fun to explore sure i don't have a good I, I, but i do think that i do definitely see a lot more people interested in it and i have a lot more colleagues who are you know mm -hmm. um adam unsworth who's my incredible great friend of mine and he's our um french horn professor mm -hmm. you know he was played with the philadelphia orchestra and the detroit symphony mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And uh, he's an incredible improviser, you know, so yeah, it's yeah, it, I, I think there's more interest in it. And I also think that there's more um, there's more opportunity, maybe. And th that, that could be because there are um, it, it could be the result of technology to some degree because of the, the there's the yeah. pan the panoply of, of musical information that is at one's fingertips. Yeah. Um, and, whereas in our day, we had to go get records, uh, you know, and so, you know, it was harder to get music kind of outside your sphere. Um, and so here it's sort of like you might get a classical piano player who's interested in Brazilian music, yeah. dance music. And, and like they just even if they don't play it, they want to know how it works and maybe how to like, you know, sit down at the piano, maybe just to mess around and play something that's fun um, for them. Right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's that's really wonderful. So let me uh, get to a couple questions, and then we'll play your tune. I don't want to keep you forever, man. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we could because oh, you and I, you and you and I can keep talking. Obviously, it's always fun to keep to to to, to talk. With um, you, so. so um so so Gabriel asks um or he says question phrased better. Okay, he uh, he said a different question. He said, I know that the current political situation will be addressed by composers this is a change of gears uh will be addressed by composers in the very near future as you talk about the variability between performances and improvisation where do we let performers say what they want about the voice you the composer are trying to bring that's a good question mm, it's a great question yeah so i'm going to answer it in kind of a dodgy way <laughs> which is put your professor hat on uh -huh. <laughs> it was one of the things that i began to realize was not going to give me necessarily a full-on career as a classical composer was that performers would come up to me and ask me, do you want it, do you want it like this? Or do you want it like this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would go, well, I don't know. Which one do you like better? 
and that was not the answer they wanted. No, no, they um, wanted they wanted precise. It's either A they or B. Wanted precise. It's either yeah. A or B. And right. I was like, well, which one? Which one feels better? You know, and that's totally the the jazz musician in you in speaking. Me that's yeah. just like, yeah, just you know, just, yeah, just play, it. man. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and so you know, I think that it'll be interesting to see how you know how this manifests itself um you know the the political one is is a so big it's, thorny it's, question yeah it's 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 huge and uh, i don't have a I, I you know i think we're all sort of wrapped up emotionally right now and mm-hmm. i don't have a good response to that um uh right now um it's just kind of too close to it i i um, I, I think and and gabriel if you um we also have a comment from bruce lazarus hi bruce nice to nice thanks for tuning in i i i think gabriel your your question isn't so much for us to sort of address specifically the or even generally the political situation which is which i guess as artists we kind of wrestle as human beings first and then that filters through the art in different ways some people feel like they need to put it in the front of their art other people it's through osmosis it comes out through the art kind of in a different way but i think his kind of question might be perhaps framed in the sense of one of um um in the one of expression right so you know where where you know let's say you write a, the piece whether it's intentional or sort of subliminal you write a piece that's sort of related to the political crisis or 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 some existential crisis in our society or whatever pandemic etc um and you you have improvisation and so now you're putting the performer in a in a space where that yeah. space has been predefined in yeah. a way that's extra musical yeah. and I, I i i guess and gabriel if that if if i if i'm parsing your question incorrectly let me know but i think his him he might be wondering like how did how does that work perhaps like yeah you know like if you write a piece and you say that this is about the pandemic or 9 11 or something like this and then if you use you, you your performer has a different way of feeling about that or maybe is uncomfortable perhaps about yeah. it. I, I don't yeah. i don't know yeah. i'm i'm just thinking about that out no, loud no that, no that's that's a those are those are really good points i i can only answer that i tend to be a whatever happens happens kind uh, of person uh. and and um but i will say that like um um there was a piece that I played a number of years ago by Marty Ehrlich called Four Altos, which is literally for four alto saxophones. And um, there's a lot of composed things in that piece, but there's also um, a lot of improvisation. And one of the interesting things, he had some ways of just kind of like directing the energy with a few little directions that allowed it to still feel like you had a little bit of control, Mm. but it was still very much the piece. Mm. And I admire, I admire that also. Mm -hmm. I would, I tend to be the kind of, you know, in this particular case, I knew I was writing it for Ellery and Ellery would do magic with it. Right. Um, it's, um, yeah. and, but I would love to hear it with somebody else to do something totally different with it and just see what happens. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And I'm okay with that. One of the things that I like about Marty's music though, is, you know, he would just, it, he would have these little instructions, like say, um, they would say things like, um, you know, not too short, of notes not too long maybe give a little bit of space here and there uh-huh it was just kind of kind like, of you know, very broad and, performative yeah. instructions yeah and, and it was it was it was cool to see how different it was um yeah every time and yet somehow it still kind of got it to worked. a cohesive space yeah but i yeah. i definitely tend to be a kind of throw caution to the wind and just uh-huh. say all right wh- whatever happens happens like let's just figure this out and, and go. maybe maybe it'll maybe it'll be cool and maybe it'll maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it, it won't, won't be <laughs> right right <laughs> so um, uh, maybe yeah. maybe that's because i've i've also i work 
as a sideman with a lot of musicians who sure. definitely don't want to be told how to play. <laughs> right. So, right. That's you know, a whole so different e uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. So that probably a lot of where that, that, that energy comes from, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a, there's a lot of different, different spaces to navigate. Mm -hmm. here, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So Bruce Lazarus says, and then we'll play your play a tune. Uh, Bruce says, "Good to hear semi improvised work that doesn't sound completely by like by chance." I think that's what he means. So just doing whatever comes naturally slash easily from the performer, or just plain silly. I, I I think I know what he means by that. In other words, kind of what I was saying. Also, it doesn't sound like it's some random splash of notes. You know. Yeah, yeah, and just like. Just like a performer who didn't really get inside to shape notated mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Ellery got in there and he was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to know this piece. I'm going to know the timing. I'm going to know. Um, it's definitely, it's, it's an interesting thing too. You mentioned the technology piece, you mm -hmm. know, I think this is the kind of piece that technology makes a little more readily available because right. you can send a, some kind of realization Mock of it up, just yeah. to kind of get yeah. an idea of what the sounds are and sure um and uh so yeah yeah um well, yeah no it's it, it it's definitely again it's not a place where i thought i would end up um when i started composing but uh, i I'm, I'm enjoying it very much and it'll it'll be interesting yeah. to see what yeah. happens so. i i had a, I, you know it flashed through my head man and i'll tell you this in a minute but we had a couple more comments come in and then, then we'll play your tune i want to set up your tune okay. i keep talking about your tune you know yeah. um joe joe sem joe summer who's a who's a very very fine composer um Writes a lot of string quartets, actually. Um, so Joe says, uh, though, though, quote, random splash of notes sounds pretty cool. It's true. In certain circumstances, random splashes of notes sound very cool. And yeah, uh, true. Yeah. And uh, Gabriel says, that's awesome. Hit the question exactly. Thank you both. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, what, what, what went through my head with technology and like, because I, I made a comment uh when when we were listening to the piece and i said it's like a music minus one so those at home who don't know what that is music minus one were these records that were released um and maybe they came out also on on tape or something this, i mean really dating ourselves when we say records and tapes but uh, you know they were cds too i'm sure right music minus one cds where they had the whole orchestra or piece without the soloist and then you know if you were learning a piece you you would play play with the record right um and uh but there's also on the jazz side there's our friend jamie abersall and and i was wondering like man if you set out like a thing like you go b flat a one a two a one two three <laughs> uh, and uh, so we... that's a that's an inside joke uh, those of you at home jamie abersall was very famous for those those basically music minus one jazz things yeah. you know yeah <laughs> we uh, i i i we often used to joke that it would be fun to have one that was you know like free you know and the the, the count off would just be play yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> right uh, <laughs> um Good. well you know i mean it's 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 a really interesting i i, I it's it's not everything not everything i've done is in this sort of zone of of sort of i i and i have done some pieces too with other woodwind players who you know are improvising at the same time and mm -hmm. then we kind of go in and out of musical zones and mm -hmm. uh i'd like to find some more fluid ways it's not everything i'm doing but it, it's it's been fun to um it's been fun to you know especially i think one of the things i'm really learning to appreciate just, just like with you, it's just getting to kind of connect with with friends from past, present, and future, and yeah. kind of yeah. dream, up pro dream up projects. You know, yeah. just say, hey, yeah. let's try yeah. this. Um, um, you know what? Let's do a percussion ensemble piece with improviser, and we'll mm -hmm. see what happens. I don't know. Right, right. Um, There's all sorts and, of po pregnant yeah. possibilities, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So Joe says, by the way, Joe Summer is also a horn player. Um, oh, okay. a very good horn player, a composer, and horn player. He said, "Music minus one LPs for me." 
<laughs> Mozart horn concerti. <laughs> and also he got mezzo arias on music minus one too. That's interesting. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah, music minus one. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, how about music plus one? Uh, that would be, how about your tune? Let me play a yeah, tune, yeah, we, which yeah, has changed do, gears a bit. This. Um, so this was a tune. Um, I just thought, you know, something uh, completely different um, mm. is, um, you know, this is a tune. I, I have a trio. Um, saxophone, bass, and drums, or woodwinds, bass, and drums. I do a lot of bass clarinet and stuff with it too. Mm -hmm. Fairly typical orc instrumentation. It happens to be a group that I've I've had since 1997. Same same uh, personnel, and it's just a, a group that's sort of been. Um, I don't know. It's just the the chemistry of this particular. You know, Gerald Cleaver is a great drummer friend of mine, and mm. and Tim Flood is a. a bass player a friend of mine and mm. um we did a record in the early 2000s and then this one's from the one that's from just maybe a few years ago and um let's see so what how can i set this up um talking about a multifaceted life at the time i was teaching at a liberal arts college um and um i was teaching uh music history uh, music history one mm -hmm. and i just got completely infatuated with the uh, once again he's, he's always blown me away with the, the music of joss ken Dupre. oh yeah and yeah. um just the balance of his you know counterpoint and lines and um and forms and tech setting and all, mm -hmm. all, all of the above mm -hmm. um and um so I ran across this while while I was teaching this class. I ran across it's a extended kind of two voice canonic figure from um, Misa Panje Lingua, um, and uh, and I based like basically this whole record kind of off of that that two voice thing and a bunch of different variations. Cool. And um, this one was the last one that I wrote and um, um, I thought it'd be kind of an interesting contrast because in this particular case, I was trying to write something that would have it, it basically where we would just play through the form of the tune. It wouldn't necessarily have a solo section, but mm -hmm. there would be little moments where I could kind of get in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was also looking for some ways to get musical cues out of the section without mm -hmm. having to kind of do that, the dreaded, you know, okay, ready, here we go. And now, you know, sure. um, yeah. and, yeah. Um, and so the little grace note in this basically cues each or or the bass has a note right before the thing and so it just mm -hmm. it allows the piece to kind of have this kind of elasticity kind of to it yeah yeah and it was the last piece i wrote i hadn't i didn't have a, a a kind of a ballad and i wanted something kind of just sort of static in nature mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So All this right. It's called the Muse. The Muse. Okay. I will just cue this up. We'll take a listen and uh, meet back up in uh, just a moment. I'll switch views. Here we get to actually look at the lead sheet for the folks at home, and we'll uh, check it out. Thank you. 
Yeah, man. Uh, Thanks. So, it, you know, what's um, interesting about the tune, I mean, it's, it's first of all, the, the way you approach the, 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 the form of it, kind of through composed with some space, right? Um, and uh, also the, impl the implication of the harmony. I'm reading the chord changes, but there's no piano or guitar yeah. playing voicing them um and so that's interesting because I, I, I and this is i'm curious about um and there's a lot we can say but actually I'll I'll, I'll 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 stop at a question for you as a as a composer and and also as a jazz player and whatnot you have it you have this this uh, structure and you've been very um, very precise about about your the harmonies that are there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because you know what the harmonies are, even though you're not necessarily playing all the notes that are there in that harmony. You're not outlining the chords necessarily, right? You're just you know it's your touch, you're tasting them, right? And um, how 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 do you approach that sort of interior world? of notating the harmony, even though the listener might not necessarily, uh, um, it's there, so it's structural, so it, it's it's not missing, but it's also, the listener doesn't look at D7 sharp 11 and say, oh yeah, clearly that's D7 sharp 11, yeah. and yeah. I'm hearing it right now, you know, like, I mean, cause, cause as, a, as a musician and as someone who reads chord changes, I can look at that and I can actually I can imagine a chord yeah. in yeah, my head. Uh, yeah. I can I can okay. comp with it in my head. Yeah, totally. But that's but that's actually not what most listeners are gonna do. They're not gonna start comping on your chord changes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm just curious about uh uh like how you thought about that compositionally. I mean, it's because this is because a lead sheet is for the musicians, not for the audience. You know, yeah. because it's yeah. 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 Well, a couple things about this piece that we were talking about too is um we recorded it and then we did a tour, mm. um, which was about a 10 day tour and where we played this every night and it sort of evolved into really what I wanted it to be. Uh -huh. um, and those little module things that kind of last for long periods of time, mm -hmm. um, um, I improvise or, or the bass player would sometimes improvise in those kind spaces. Of play over to, that yeah. space, yeah. Um, for me, sometimes I, I guess, um, I like to give myself a little, I, I think when I was playing around with this, this was like a need based piece too, because mm. I had written like a lot of, um, there, there was a lot of like really kind of dark and I mean, and I needed something that was slow, but it had kind of a, um, you know, a sort of a more, uh not sure what the adjective best adjective to describe it was it, you know i didn't i didn't want it to be just this like inc it definitely has some dark moments in it but it for the most part you know it's very mm. fluffy mm. harmony mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and so i wanted to at least kind of imagine what that would be like mm -hmm. um i i definitely the other part of this though too is i definitely just worked out the two voice thing before right. I imagined the, because the that harmony. was the genesis of that, yeah. right? That two voice. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, um, that's, that's the other element of, of this. Um, I know this is something that, um, I do sometimes in a lot of my, um, kind of jazz writing is that I'll essentially just write a two part counterpoint and then sort of figure out what the harmony is underneath mm -hmm. it. I have mm -hmm. done this with, with a pianist, and guitar players mm. and it's it's fun to hear what they do with it mm -hmm. sometimes it ends up kind of taking on a kind of almost debussy like yeah character. kind of and then, because it's atmospheric the, with these the harmonies themselves are very yeah, atmospheric wc and exactly. sort of overtony yeah but a lot of times too the the other interesting thing though too that is that it'll end up taking like um I did this with a guitar player once who played it much more transparently and hmm. like more, more dyadically hmm. 
you know hmm. than 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 like these sort of rich kind of big harmonies. voices yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's so, almost like herbie hancock or somebody like that yeah where, it's just like, where you kind of almost like you're playing a third line yeah yeah as opposed to a, yeah right yeah and so um yeah no it's just um it's funny because it was um it's just one of those pieces and that's partly why I, I, I was thinking about that there's this renaissance painting called the nine muses mm, um, mm, you mm -hmm. know involves like sort of a there's a thing about dorian and phrygian and you know mm -hmm. um it's like a, kind of one of the renaissance rediscovering of the greek mythos kind mm -hmm. of drawings and i was, mm -hmm. was thinking a little bit about that um as well um kind of modes as light and dark and sure um, sure um but uh it was also like one of those pieces that like i agonized almost every uh, over every other piece and this one like literally came together in like 10 minutes <laughs> <You know>? so, <laughs> so that's how it happens and, man sometimes yeah. i know and and i also i wanted a piece that where i could kind of draw out that it's fun to play this live and it's a little I think it, it's it's definitely more experiential live because mm, mm. as a performer you can really make the audience uncomfortable with that repetition um, yeah it's fun to play with that uh -huh, sometimes uh -huh. and kind of feel uh -huh. like it's like all right i'm just gonna i'm just i'm not moving i'm not moving i'm, I'm gonna I'm, stay I'm here i'm gonna be disciplined about this right and um and then other times where it's like, you know, okay, let's just real quickly, we'll get through this and move on. And so I was trying to kind of write like sort of attention and release kind of exercise sure, in that way for, sure, my, for myself. Sure. Discipline is a good word for it. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. Well, well, actually, it would take a lot of discipline to play this in a, in a, uh, in a kind of its purest way, right? Yeah. Because it's, yeah. you know, um, and uh, I think you mentioned about the live performance the live performance aspect versus a recording i mean it's it's an it's a beautifully it's a beautiful recording it's nice playing uh mm -hmm. but definitely like a like the 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 drama of this i of a piece like this visually and and live kind of as you're kind of you the energies in the room i think that make will really make this i can understand as a performer this becomes a lot more fun and interesting of a piece to uh play in a live situation it it, it is that's very yeah. true um and um that since we're talking about improvising and composition mm -hmm. um i um i had an experience one time where i had done some improvised pieces next to performing some some classical pieces mm -hmm. like, you know Ber Berios and Quinza mm -hmm. and, and they were I, I I improvised some things sort of in that zone and then I played the piece and it was it was fun and interesting to kind of think about when I improvised I had control I could sense what the audience I would could try to sense what the audience was comfortable with and I could either coax that out longer mm -hmm. or I could move on and make everybody more comfortable again. <laughs> um, right. and, and ideally we have that. And, and, and maybe this just has to do more with, with this, you know, like you see that person. I, I remember, Oh, you probably know that Stephen Drury. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, Stephen absolutely. Drury, yep. I remember seeing him play the Elliot Carter Night Fantasies uh -huh. and going, "Oh my gosh, it sounds like he's making it's up on the spot. It's so alive, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't believe the shapes that he could pull out of it. It literally sounded, I mean, not it sounded like a like a Carter piece, but I, I just it meant it had the fluidity of just something that mm -hmm. was being made up on the spot. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that just really has always fascinated me. Um, mm -hmm. 
And uh, um, so, yeah, this was definitely a piece kind of trying to get at that, in, but, it, but in an improvisational sh- way. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. Uh, let's. I'm going to switch views and see if we have any uh, any comments. Um, let's flip over here, and I will flip over to the page here and see what we got going on here. Uh, um, oh, I, so Joseph Summer says the the mezzo thing is for his wife, not for him. He's a horn player. Uh, that no. was from earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, I, I don't want to keep you too much. I mean, we're coming up on the nine thirty here, and I usually try to wrap up around there. So, I mean, yeah. we'll uh, we'll 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 put a bookmark on this, and if within a few minutes, uh, if anybody else has any thoughts, comments, or questions before uh, uh, I let uh, um, uh, Andy off the hook for the night, uh, please uh, pop them in. Um, and I also say this too: if you um, are watching a replay of this and you want to ask a, a question, uh, please put it in the comments. Um, I'll try to get to it. Uh, Andrew will try to get to it. Yep. Um, that sort of thing. And I'll also leave in the description, um, some links where you can find some more of, uh, of, of Andy's music, um, as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I think that like, some of the best classical performances I've experienced have been by performers, you know, performers like, like, like Steve Drury, for example, who's phenomenal or whatever, where it, it either feels like it's a piece that is improvised or it's a piece that like, say an older piece, like I've been to, to performances and you probably have been to performances of the same thing where you'll hear say Bach or Beethoven or something like this and very well-known repertoire I'll say like like I'll I one thing I'm thinking in particular is some uh Beethoven piano sonatas this is a pianist fa- fabulous uh um uh a pianist uh Brian Gans um who is a kind of a Chopin like that like Chopin is like one of his big things but but he also did the Beethoven cycle and he played a recital of some Beethoven sonatas, um, some of the, some of the, the 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 better known ones, but also some of the ones that usually aren't aren't played very often. And um, man, you know, like I went into that concert, and I he was a phenomenal. I knew he was a great pianist, but I I kind of went into that concert thinking, eh, well, I, I, it'll be over. Like I'll be drinking wine in about an hour and a half. Like like you know, it was like I wasn't really in the mood to listen to Beethoven for an hour and a half, and. You know, I mean, I like it, but like, you know, come on, like, like, yeah. you know, this, this, this is the whole program. Yeah. And so, but I was on the edge of my seat for mm-hmm. 90 minutes. And you know why? Because the way he played it, like you, you used a very good way of describing shapes, pulling different shapes out that I'd never heard before. And in like, he, he wasn't changing the notes. He wasn't like that. Everything was, you know, if you looked, if you had the score, you, you you know, he was following the, what, you know, the, the or or text, yeah. but man, he, the way he was playing it, the way, what he was able to voice out of the instrument, how he was able to shape the dynamics of the, the shadings made it sound like these were pieces that were written last week. I know. That's, and I'm thinking to myself, shit, this is Beethoven. How did this happen? I went up to him afterwards and I was just blown away. I was like, I wish, I wish everybody played Beethoven like that. Yeah, I, I've had that experience too, where I, I think it was a hearing, I can't remember who it was, hearing, hearing them play Chopin, and it just literally, it felt like, and I think I'll do it again, and I think I'll do it again, and I think I'll do it again, right. I think I'll do it again, and now we're moving on, you know, and you're just <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> and you're just like, oh my God, it sounds, it sounds so fluid, and yeah, um, I've definitely had that experience. I mentioned Tim McAllister, my yeah, I, that's phenomenal. colleague, yeah, he, 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 he can draw out a piece like that where you're just like, Oh my gosh, it just, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of differing, you know, there's a lot, certainly a lot of different schools of thought and how, sure. how, how to, how to philosophies do that. Philosophies, how to but, approach, but it, yeah. But it, um, and, um, but it's 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 certainly a. I, 
let me put it this way that as an improviser and as somebody who also loves notated music mm -hmm. um it was something that just really it, it always draws me in um and uh mm -hmm. um yeah and those uh, uh, also just i have tons of little anecdotes and quotes that you know just of various composers um that you know the composer's thoughts on that kind of idea right are, you know notion, it's like okay yeah. this was a little different but i, I kind of liked it you know or, yeah yeah or like you listen to the stravinsky you know he conducts at different points in his career and the tempos are slightly oh, different and, right you know, right different ways of because he's yeah. thinking about it differently yeah you know, yeah and yeah. then th then you there's also all of these interesting you know is that okay and right what, what was you know should, right. should you play it the way that right. it was written you know yeah and, yeah yeah, yeah. And it's so, it's I, it's kind of interesting and i and i um I, like again i don't want to I, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I, I just think it's interesting, like performance practice by itself can do so much service to the music. And it sounds like I'm Captain Obvious, but it's it's like one of those things that's obvious to everybody, but not obvious to everybody. Yeah. And it can really make the music sing or not. And it's, you know, it's like, you know, is it sometimes the music's fault? Well, if it's like us new com new composers, we certainly... You know, we can step in puddles and go, whoops, that's my, my bad. I, that, you know, but, uh, but, you know, for some of the music that, 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 that's out there that we consider music of, uh, sort of a, in a timeless kind of variety, um, the service to it, you can, you can play it or you can play it. And, um, if you're going to put the time into it, man, you should really play it. And it, it's kind of like, I often wonder what, rock musicians would think of like the idea of the cover band that plays the tunes just like the record yeah now like i i, I don't know because i'm not in that world and but i'm fascinated by this idea of replication yeah. of like you're going to play the exact solo the way the solo is exactly as it was on the 1982 record of whatever yeah and and People pay to go to hear that. They pay to go to hear a yeah. live version of the record that they ha already have at home and listen to a thousand times. Yeah. And it's kind of like the same thing with classical performance practice, right? Yeah. But I wonder, like, is there, do they have the same kind of like nuanced discussions about, well, maybe I should put play that B flat a little louder than it was done on the record? I, I don't know. I'm just, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be, I know. I'm not trying to talk down about it. I'm just, I just think it's interesting. Oh, it, me too. And and I guess that's that's what I was gonna say is I these kind of questions used to like really stress me out actually. And and now that it's just I just find it it's just fun to yeah. think about. Yeah. And I'll tell uh, maybe a good one to end on that on this front too is that um, um I I'm a huge baroque music fan um and you know probably my favorite class to ever take and teach is 18th century counterpoint it's yeah i yeah. love teaching that stuff because it's just like the puzzles and the you know yeah it's, but yeah it's, but also it's beautiful music and yeah yeah i love getting into the embellishments and mm -hmm. and uh but i will tell you that um <laughs> I, I, I had a social media post because I pract I literally practice Bach probably every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will never play it in public ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's your because, thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because A, just because I know the standard is just so Yeah, the bar, high. the bar is really high, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and I had a funny, you know, like a funny social media post where I just said despite having, you know, taught 18th century counterpoint and, you know, written fugues in the style of Bach and playing it every day, I will never play this stuff. Um, just because it's so, I don't know, there's, 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 I, there's definitely a secret element to it mm -hmm. as well. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, right. Know, of course, it's it. You know, actually, uh, the, the 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 idea of music for one's own uh, pleasure, yeah. like I mean, you know, you and I do this for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, as composers, we create sound worlds, uh, mm -hmm. and largely those are our sound worlds that we share yeah. with other people. And when you play. You you play with other musicians and share sound worlds together that then you share with other people. But like even if you didn't share it with anyone else, there's still that kind of um, I mean it is a it's a little bit I guess selfish to say, but it is kind of like our thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so like it's totally cool to play bait. I mean I mean or, I mean Bach at home. I I often dream of actually you know like working up some Bach just for myself like not to not at ever to play a recital or to to subject anybody to it right yeah but it's yeah it's it's uh i don't know i i just always i feel more balanced when i when i practice it and yeah that's why i just play yeah. through it every day yeah. you know it's just like it's, um yeah so well man uh i uh i i this was really fun this is a great pleasure to have you on. I, I thank I, you so much. This is really fun for me too. So. I wanted to um, uh, I there's I I had one little extra thing uh, queued up, not music or anything, but it's it it's funny. I think you might you might you'll laugh at this, because I was thinking earlier today, and we never got to say this earlier, so I'll just we'll put this at the end of of our first conversation, back in Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. and we were walking uh back from i think uh it, it might have been the brown jug or something uh <laughs> a, a, after uh which is so those of you who have not been to ann arbor brown jug it's still there it's a yep. beer plate pizza place it's like the joke was is that no matter how much beer or pizza you had it was always five bucks <laughs> but um we were coming back I, we were walking back and we, you and i had um um you know started talking like oh hey you know and then like i found out you were into jazz and i'm into jazz and so like you know we started like talking about that and at some point like because you asked like where i'm from and i said I'm from boston whatever and and it came out that i was a new england patriots fan uh -huh. right and then that so we had a bonding moment on that because because you are too but it's not just because you like the patriots but you said well you know my my cousin and so um so the uh the thing that I queued up to put over your face. <laughs> There's your cousin. Um, and uh, and like I totally well, well see at that time, right? And so for those of those of you who don't know at home, the 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 gentleman who's now plastered over Andrew's face uh, is his cousin Steve, uh, Steve Grogan, who's the quarterback for the New England Patriots from I think he was drafted in 74. Yeah, yeah, it was around somewhere in the mid seventies. Yeah. yeah, and he was the starting quarterback from like seventy six to eighty six, basically eighty five, yeah. eighty six, yeah. and um, he was one of the. He's a beloved player. Um, and um, uh, here I'll get him off your face there, <laughs> uh, but he um, he's a he's a beloved. You know, he's like you know every there isn't a New England sports fan that doesn't know who Steve Grogan is, and um. And it was terrific quarterback, by the way. I mean, just phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, he and, had some great like years, you know. Beautiful. It's just a beautiful human, too. So he was just always such a genuine, is just such a genuine person, you know, yeah, too. Yeah. So. And so we had that moment. And at, and at that time, <laughs> and so uh, if, if, you're, if you're younger than, you know, 40, you won't remember a time when the Patriots didn't suck. <laughs> and except for this year. And, <laughs> and so at that time you and i were like oh were they gonna go like two and because i think they did they went like two and 14 and then they drafted drew bledsoe yeah yeah they suck those are the rod rust years and and yeah. and i man um so we that was our we we bonded over jazz and beer and pizza but also over football so i i've got another crazy crazy um um anecdote on that front to bring back in the beatles uh -huh. too, is that um i was at the monday night football game when they announced that john lennon had just been shot oh in december of 80 oh wow yeah and um john smith who was the kicker 
for the team, um, went out and scored and kicked a field goal right after right after Howard Cosell announced that. Uh, mm, wow! So some somebody was uh, uh, I, I I forgot how I re- recovered that, and I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot that moment. That yeah. moment, yeah, yeah it's such yeah. a such a huge moment, but yeah, Patriots. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and then my dad, my dad, even though I grew up, you know, in Kansas, my dad was from Waltham, so I grew up also a Red Sox fan. So yeah, yeah, you, you know, once a Boston sports fan, it's real hard to get it out of your blood, you know. No, it's yeah, it's true. Anyway, man, thank you so so hey, much. Thank you. It was thank great. You. Um, I always make this uh this this thing uh that um uh you know I always I'll do like a where are they now uh uh thing and sometimes so we'll have you on in another year or so and see what you're doing so Sounds good. um man this was super great um thank you so so much and so for everyone else uh here i'm gonna flip my view there oh there um so thanks for tuning in tonight um i hope you had uh, a good time uh listening to some of uh uh, Andrew's music and uh, getting to to hear us talk and um, again if you uh, are watching this on a replay and have any kind of questions or comments uh, please put them in the uh, comment section of uh, either Facebook or YouTube and also uh, if you want to definitely check out some more of of, um, of Andrew's uh, compositions and jazz playing um, I will put some links in, in the video descriptions um, for things that are coming up um, I don't, I, I probably will do this sometime next week. Uh, I'm going to do a live stream on is the circle of fifths wrong. And, uh, and I'll tell you why I think the circle of fifths is in daylight savings time and should probably be in daylight standard time. And if that doesn't make any sense, it, it, it will, uh, hopefully after I do my little live stream on that. Um, and the other thing, uh, whoops, I got this little transition is the next episode is in uh, a couple of weeks. Um, and oh boy, this is uh, exciting. Here we go. Uh, Timothy Marr. Uh, Tim is a friend of mine. He's a professor of uh, composition uh, and also director of the bands, uh, wind bands at St. Olaf College in, in Minnesota. Um, so we'll have Tim on on uh, the 17th of January. Uh, so I hope uh, you will um, come back to uh, join us then. And the very last thing I'll do is the ubiquitous subscribe. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, uh, please do. Um, very appreciate your support. Um, so please, wherever you are, uh, stay safe, practice responsible social distancing. Uh, don't let the noise of the week, no matter how noisy it's been, distract you from the fact that uh, um, things uh, in, inevitably come in cycles and, 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 and we are on a, on a upswing. So, um, so for that, uh, with that, uh, until the next time, thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.